already. We're only a couple minutes in. Uh, I am so glad to have everybody here. Can you hear me okay, though? Would you rather me talk in the mic? Or would yeah, you just rather me talk? In the mic? Okay. We had a host. <coughs> I'm a little bit of a wander uh, as I as I communicate, but one of the things that I wanted to do this morning was just say thank you for all of you coming, supporting the presentation this morning, and this is a huge community endeavor, and uh, I must say that I'm extremely proud of the efforts uh, within the, the community as we started with the Swan Valley Business Consortium almost two years ago now. Um, the stakeholders involved um, have done a great, great job. And I must say thank you to everybody, uh, whether it's you know Stacy helping with notes and, and uh, Naomi and and uh, the Westwood you know giving us space. And I think overall the biggest thing is that we have a, a group of like-minded individuals that have come together to say, hey, you know what, we're going to communicate with each other and we're going to help each other out regardless of, of what the issues are within the community. So it's it's absolutely fantastic, and I'm thrilled to have you all here this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. So just a couple little housekeeping things. For those of you, or most of you that have been in here before, obviously, fire exits at the back and out here should something occur. Um, we've got washrooms right out here. Coffee is on at the back, so please help yourself at any time if you need anything. And uh, ultimately, what we'd like to do today is give everybody a little bit of information. Information that we can use to help ourselves uh, gain a little bit of knowledge about what's going on in the community. Um, I guess over the last probably year and a half, we started asking ourselves in our meetings the hard questions things that we need to, to look at from a policy system development standpoint, community safety and security standpoint. And I'm encouraged to, uh, to say that there's been a lot of great feedback from everybody. And it's, at, it's you know, in my opinion, uh, we started very humbly with just a few organizations getting together. We knocked on a few doors. We let it grow organically. There's no hierarchical structure to the organization. It's all about uh, our mantra, which is, um, bring what you can and take what you need uh, as an organization within the, the community as, as you participate. And I love the fact that all the stakeholders are willing to share uh, competitiveness aside. At the end of the day, we're all dealing with some of the same issues within the community. And some of the issues are obviously widespread, which is why we have Corey here today to speak to us and give us some, some ideas to what he's been saying. Now, I first seen Corey uh, in 2019 at the WCB conference, and uh, I was enthralled with the message. Uh, absolutely fantastic. A lot of the specifics will, will resonate, and I think overall it will give us some tools that we can work with. We have a regular meeting coming up on the 27th, which we're now going to dive into some of these issues, and we know that it's not just singular, and if anybody would have read the, uh, the article that we put out last week on this, as well as what we've already discussed, we know that there's no silver bullet, and the idea is what can we do from a grassroots perspective to address some of these issues. So with that being said, oh, Stacy, you wanted me. The sign-in sheet, where are they? Have they? Are they making their way around still? Awesome, okay, thank you. Without further ado then, what I'd like to do is, is begin. So what we're gonna start off with this morning is Corey's gonna give a presentation, now we'll have time for questions. And as I said in the agendas and in the article, then we're gonna follow up with Neil, Neil Lives, who's our, our local community health nurse, and he'll be providing some specifics as well from a regional perspective. So that'll complement the discussion as we go. There will be uh, question and answer periods as we go through as well. Okay, Corey, I'll let you do your own. Sure. Sounds good. So I'll ask you, if I talk like this, can you guys hear me okay? I despise using mics, but I will if you need me to use one. Thumbs up in the back? Yeah. For sure? Okay. Uh, if you can, just let me know and I'll uh, grab the mic. Um, I'll take up about uh, four hours of your time today <laughs> uh, for the presentation. It'll likely be about an hour or so. Uh, at the most. Um, a big thanks to Derek. Um, he's ultimately the one that's booked me for this and uh, the small town attitude that was shown uh, throughout the process is fantastic. Uh, we had uh, dinner uh, together last night. Uh, that typically doesn't happen in, in Winnipeg. <laughs> so thank you for having me and welcoming me. Um, I've been in EMS for about 22 years, almost 23 years. Um, that's when you gasp and say you're so young. How is that possible? <laughs> it doesn't work anymore, I find. But uh, I was an ambulance paramedic um, in Winnipeg, mostly in the North End, for about 13 or 14 years. Um, I promoted into our 911 center, uh, where I supervised our communication center for three years. And I moved into this role about five ish years ago. Um, so I'm in charge of uh, community relations for EMS, essentially. So anything uh, related to paramedicine in Winnipeg, that's my shtick. 
Um, before when I would leave the perimeter highway, I used to get vaporized by a big laser beam. Um, and since we've been uh, essentially within the umbrella of provincial shared health, as you all probably know, um, I'm now allowed to leave the city of Winnipeg. So you're going to be seeing me uh, outside the city a lot. Um, I, I developed this drug education program about the end of 2016. Uh, where in Winnipeg, actually nationally, we saw a surge in responses to drugs like fentanyl. Um, and you've all heard of fentanyl before. I am going to talk about that today. Um, and essentially, I was sitting in my office one day and I wanted to do more than just respond to the incident because it was often too late. Um, frontline services, be it paramedicine, police, fire, um, are a very um, reactionary service, right? Which means we wait for the incident to happen, then we respond. Um, and again, it was often too late. I wasn't happy with the existing drug programming within um, our country, really. Uh, drug education in high schools, I always say no offense to teachers, I love them, but I didn't think a phys ed teacher should be providing drug education to our youth. Um, I don't think they're the subject matter experts. They don't have, they've never been in the trenches and a lot of the information that I was finding uh, provincially was simply not current. A lot of their information was false and they were still using scare tactics. Uh, one example that I came into in 1617 was uh, the education system. Some of the phys ed teachers were telling the kids don't use marijuana because it's laced with fentanyl. And that's not true, absolutely not true. So when you start using scare tactics and your information is not current, any credibility you work to get is typically gone. Um, so anyway, I probably engaged about 15,000 uh, high school students in Winnipeg. Um, I was just invited to sit on the provincial curriculum uh, development team. So for the addictions and drug education in the curriculum, um, I, I finally got the invite about a week ago. So they're going to be revamping the entire system in our province, which is fantastic. Um, I also uh, do some work with the CSA. Uh, we're developing pre-hospital drug response national standards. And that's a really cool uh, gig that I'm part of because uh, I'm able to travel the country. So I've been to all the big cities, the Vancouver's, Toronto, Montreal, etc. And I can kind of see what flavor they have. Uh, when you talk about drug use or substance use disorders, every city, every community is really quite different, um, right? Street drugs are everywhere, <coughs> but every city demands one substance more than the other. You look at Vancouver, it's heroin and fentanyl, right? Yes, they have methamphetamine and cocaine and benzos, but it's really heroin and uh, fentanyl. When you start breaking your way east, methamphetamine starts to spike, right? So Saskatchewan and Manitoba are all about methamphetamine. But you need to bring it back when you educate people on substance use disorders and talk about the plethora of everything street drugs. Because as a society, we're, we're, we're missing something <coughs> in Manitoba where all we talk about is methamphetamine. And that's quite dangerous. If you don't talk about polysubstance use, which is multiple substances, that's quite dangerous. Um, there's a couple of communities uh, that have had a huge issue with um, drugs like coke, right? So cocaine is a huge issue, let's, let's just say in Thompson. Uh, so let's say they're educating the heck out of their community for cocaine, now they're seeing a spike in methamphetamine. But they haven't been providing the education for methamphetamine, so now they're playing catch up, now they're kind of panicking, right? If you talk about every substance, you're going to check off all those boxes. So. I think that's a miss locally, something that, that we haven't been doing. Um, I was at a conference in Ottawa uh, in November and it was, a, it was supposed to be a national substance use conference and there was no mention of methamphetamine at all. Like when you watch the, the national news, they'll cover BC, Alberta and Ontario, <laughs> right? And I think that's kind of because the prairie provinces are super, super recognized. And that was blatantly obvious to me when I was in uh, Ottawa. They did not talk about methamphetamine. Um, so anyway, we'll uh, talk about a whole bunch of stuff today. Um, if you want, we can save our questions or just shoot your hand up during the presentation so we don't miss anything, okay? Um, so who knows about the Good uh, Samaritan Drug Law Act? Okay, so I see like maybe three hands. Wow. Um, and when I do these presentations, I speak at tons of conferences with um, like a thousand people, a big sea of people um, sitting up in front of me. And when I ask that question, if you're a professional group or a community group or a high school, I get the same response. Maybe three or four people kind of put their hand up. 
And that's, that's really scary. The Good Samaritan uh, law was passed in May of 2016. And what was happening was, I always pick on the front row people. So we're all best friends, the four of us, five of us. And we're gonna go off and party tonight. And if we have recreational quantity of street drugs on us, I overdose or poison myself and I become unconscious. And my friend calls 911. If the paramedics and the police arrive, do you think we're going to be arrested for those drugs? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, the answer is no. And so the federal government stepped in because what was happening was my best friends were bailing on me. They were leaving me to die because they didn't want their parents to find out, their teachers to find out, and they did not want to be arrested by the police. So they got rid of that. They're saying if you call 911 to save somebody's life and you have recreational quantity drugs on you, you cannot be arrested for those drugs. And that's a good thing. I love the police, I'm super pro-police, but we needed to get rid of that stigma as everybody that's addicted is not necessarily a dirtbag. <laughs> and if we treat it like a health issue, we can hopefully provide care and treatment for that person. Um, and I've seen it lots of times in, in my career. I don't know how much death I've seen in 22, 23 years. I have no idea. Winnipeg's big it, and at times it can be a, a, a really nasty city. Um, and I've seen it where we've got young people that are surrounded by their best friends and they leave them to die because they don't want to be charged or they, they don't want to be in trouble. Um, one example was um, super sad. A few years ago in Winnipeg, there was uh, a younger guy that had overdosed and he ended up dying <laughs> and his parents found out on social media because the kids that stood around videotaping him died posted it on, on social media. So for the parents to find out they just lost their child, they had to find it on, on, on social media. That's absolutely appalling. So the message is you call 911, you wait for the paramedics, and we hopefully can uh, save that person's life. So spread that word. Um, the problem with that, that's a federal law. I don't think they advertised it enough because most of society does not know about this. So spread the word. The problem is, is if you didn't watch the news, for that one little segment where they were advertising this, you're not gonna know about it, okay? So hopefully in your high school, you got posters everywhere, <laughs> wink, wink, that are encouraging people to find out what this law is, okay? Um, I don't know if we have sound on this. Let's see if this works. Oop, one sec. <clears throat> So if you're old enough, which some of you are, you'll remember that commercial, and uh, it gets the same reaction. People smile and giggle, and you're supposed to, because that was the extent of some of the drug training or the education that we used to get. They would repeatedly play that commercial, and again, a gym teacher would call me in. That was my drug training in high school. They'd call you into a gym. They would provide that video, talk about drugs for a few minutes, and check that box off. And that does absolutely nothing. Right? That's actually quite comical. The education piece is completely not there. That doesn't tell you anything. It's this sort of sexy commercial that talks about don't doing drugs and they crack an egg. So what? So thank God uh, we've evolved um, to the point where we're going to actually educate people. And the premise is not to use scare tactics. Um, the premise is to provide the education and the training so hopefully people in society will make better choices moving forward. So um, when you guys watch the news, or you keep your ear to the ground locally, you're probably talking about methamphetamine. And I am assuming when you watch the news, you don't hear about opioids anymore, correct? Fentanyl and carfentanil and oxy and Percocet, you don't hear about that. Um, I'm trying to correct that. I've done lots of media and I'm gonna start poking them again. We've got a great corporate media team that's gonna poke them because we have to revisit opioids. The focus today will be methamphetamine, but I can tell you the opioid situation in Winnipeg is again spiking. It's actually higher than we were in 2016 and 2017. And I, I never thought we would peak what we saw then. So again, you wanna talk about poly substance use, okay? Uh, opioids will be pretty quick. They're a synthetic substance, um, which means they're human made. And when you overdose or you take too much of an opioid, it binds to an opioid receptor <coughs> primarily found within your brain. 
Okay, so that opioid travels to your brain, it attaches to that receptor site. You take too much of it, that part of your brain will actually turn off. And the problem is, is your respiratory drive system is also that same part of your brain. So these people stop breathing. That's why people are dying. Yep. Is there hand out or a place we can access this data so I don't have to write it all down? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which is it? Hand out or? Uh, I'm probably going to point you on to a website and I can definitely uh, provide some of these slides as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am a St. John's Ambulance upper state instructor. So when you said only three people put their hands up, how many people here are actually trained in first aid because that's part of yeah. the other course. That's right. Right. But um, one thing I wanted to ask is you said that if they're under the influence and or if their friends are uh, under the influence of drugs or have them on them that they won't get charged if it's uh, the recreational use. Does that still go by alcohol if they're... Definitely, know? yeah, okay. yeah, for sure, okay. right? I mean, the, the idea is any substance that can, Im can essentially impair you, they want to protect you from charges, okay? So, um, that's kind of what fentanyl does. So when you look at how many people have died because their that part of their brain is just turning off and they stop breathing. So drugs like fentanyl, demerol, carfentanil, oxycodone, methadone, those are all opioids. Um, and the problem is, is um, I went to a police conference a few months ago and the head of the Canada Drug Testing Lab was there. He's a brilliant man and he said, I can't look at a substance and tell you what it is nowadays. It has to go away and be tested. So you can't tell me I know what a drug is just from looking at it. That's not the case anymore. We used to be able to do that maybe four or five years ago because things weren't so cross-contaminated and they're not cutting everything with drug A, B, C, and D. So if, if the expert himself has to say, I have to test these drugs to know what they are, um, community members and students and people, lay public, cannot look at a drug and tell me what it is for sure, okay? If you're getting Oxy on the street, it was a super popular drug back in the 90s, the early 2000s. It's still very popular, but it's harder to get legitimate real Oxy nowadays. So what's happening is the criminal element, I'm not law enforcement obviously, but they're pumping out a whole bunch of fake pills. And we know that. There's fake Oxy, Percocet, fake Xanax, fake T3s, and a lot of them are pure fentanyl. So what's happening is that people are thinking they're getting drug A, B, or C, the criminal element does not care. They're cutting and lacing a lot of their supply with pure fentanyl, and they're stamping them to look just, just like the real thing. Um, it happened to one of my best friends in Winnipeg. Uh, he's a police officer, his wife is a teacher, um, so like not the type of family that you think would be dealing with this. Um, their son was not a drug user, not a drug addict. He had a sinus infection for about two weeks, and his best friend said, I have a pill that's gonna help you sleep. They didn't know what it was. They thought it was maybe a Percocet, maybe a T3. He took the pill in their living room, walked to his bedroom, he was dead within about 60 seconds. So he had pure fentanyl, he didn't know that. And he had enough fentanyl from one criminally made pill to kill about eight people. So if you hear the word kill pill on the street, that's part of that drug culture is that these kill pills are floating around that are criminally made that are laced with pure fentanyl. Um, and those are floating around. And people that are addicted realize that, but they are addicted. They're willing to play with that loaded gun, so to speak, okay? So those are some of the um, opioids that are out there. Anybody heard of purple heroin? Other than the police, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, so has nobody heard of the drug purple heroin here? Okay, so again, one person maybe, which is incredible. I do too. Uh, okay, excellent, so two, okay? So, and it, it's pretty incredible. When I present to a high school or a conference, sometimes a whole bunch of people put their hand up, and I love that, because it means you're, you're, you're like an informed member of our um, uh, country, really. So purple heroin is basically heroin cut with fentanyl. So heroin's not bad enough, they're now lacing it or cutting it with pure fentanyl. Um, and the problem, so we've known about this drug for about a year and a half. We can forecast usually way ahead of time. We can look to Vancouver and Halifax, both port cities, and kind of look at what their drug culture is currently, and we know Manitoba will eventually get there. We're always behind everything, right? 
So you just wait a bit and then you can forecast this coming in. So I can catch these things early and go and educate the city of Winnipeg and now the province of Manitoba. The problem with this stuff is there's also a supply of cocaine that's been dyed purple. So you've got purple cocaine, you've got purple heroin, they're dying it orange, red, yellow, black. I've seen all sorts of different colors. So again, you don't know what you're getting. And if you're a professional that's happily snorting cocaine, which we know happens, um, and you look at methamphetamine as a dirty street drug, that's what people look at it as. A big news flash, if you're happily snorting cocaine six or eight times a day, you're likely intaking methamphetamine because they've shown there's an enormous supply of cocaine that's been laced with methamphetamine. So I often get a, a pretty good reaction from a big group of people. I guarantee you some of those professionals use cocaine. And when I tell them, look at the results, the, 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 the drug testing lab will tell you there's a supply that's been cut with methamphetamine, okay? Um, Xanax, <coughs> if you haven't heard of Xanax, it's a benzo, benzo type drug. And it's a prescription drug that will treat things like social anxiety and social phobia. A lot of young adults are given this medication. It's a good drug when you follow the instructions of your physician, but it's becoming mutually <coughs> acceptable to just pop a Xanax, even if it's not yours. So if you're a young person, right, you're stressed out, you break up with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you're not getting along with your parents, you don't like your teacher, you're struggling in life, it's becoming normal to just pop a Xanax, again, even if it's not yours. And that's super scary. That was the supply that they seized in Montreal. Um, they got over two million fake Xanax bars and a lot of it was pure fentanyl. So very concerning if you've got, and I, I'm not only talking about youth, I often reference youth because their frontal lobe is not developed. That's why they do stupid things sometimes. Doesn't mean that they're not being held, held very responsible for their actions, but if that supply hit the street and it's normal to pop a Xanax for our youth, I would imagine we likely would have lost some young people, okay? Uh, typically, you're supposed to dose yourself with this drug. That's why they're called Xanny bars or Xanax bars. You break off a piece and you slowly dose yourself per the instruction of your physician. What do you think the society is doing for the most part? They're not dosing themselves, they just pop the whole pill, okay? So know if you abuse real Xanax, you can actually destroy part of your brain that regulates something called GABA, and essentially that keeps you where you want to be, no high highs and low lows. And real Xanax can actually start to destroy that function. So you become clinically depressed, very aggressive, sometimes violent, and bad things start to happen, okay? Water tabs is another one. These were huge in Winnipeg. They're still out there. Um, is anybody heard of waters before? Okay, so again, maybe two people it looks like. So everybody's heard of acid though, right? Oh yeah. So <laughs> when you look at acid, it kind of looks like that. They're little squares of paper. The difference with this stuff is they'll spray the whole sheet with liquid opioid. So they spray the whole sheet down with carfentanil or fentanyl, and then they sell a piece of paper in a little dime bag. And users will put it on their tongue. They absorb the opioid through their mucous membranes. Your tongue is extremely vascular, right? That's why as a healthcare professional, you administer medication, but you know, you tell them to lift their tongue up, it's very vascular. Um, some rave parties or rave or bar scenes, we've seen people wear these on their foreheads. They throw a bandana or a toucan and they go off and they party and they can absorb the drug through their foreheads that way. Um, we've seen them in armpits, groin, skin folds, they activate it with heat and sweat and they absorb the opioid that way. That was seized in Winnipeg, about 1,500 blotter taps. And they'll put rap, uh, rap bands, I've seen Jets logos, cartoon characters, bands, you name it. It makes their product marketable and cool, right? Um, just before Halloween, three years ago in Winnipeg, there was a local dirt bag that was making a bunch of these things. And to show you how low these high level manufacturers think, he was stamping a picture of a witch riding a broomstick. And that's disgusting. Right before Halloween. Not suggesting they're gonna drop these in kids' bags, but what happens if a little munchkin is off trick-or-treating and they see one of these things laying on, on a sidewalk? They're probably gonna pick it up. My son would have. <laughs> they're kids and it's Halloween. Everybody's guard is down, right? Um, I spoke at um, an international uh, sort of a drug webinar um, to the Mexican government, the American government, and the Canadian government. I'm still struggling to know why I was picked to do that. 
I don't get nervous to talk in front of groups, but that one was a, a little different. <laughs> um, and interesting, this, the US, they had two DEA people on that panel, and they had never heard of blotter tabs, which is incredible. These are drug experts. The blotter tabs in the States are not a huge, big, big issue, okay? Um, so these are our opioid patients. I can only speak to Winnipeg and I apologize for that. Uh, I don't have statistical data outside of the perimeter. And to be completely honest, rurally, they're not very good data collectors yet. Um, we've got two data analysts in our department, so the information I can get is phenomenal. We had 788 people last year that were affected by opioids within the city of Winnipeg. You can see how that spiked, right? I, I never thought we would have been worse than 16, 17 but you're not hearing about it because media is cyclical. They can't cover the same thing every single day because you eventually get bored and you stop watching that program. I love the media, but they have to change their story. So we're gonna come and revisit some of these issues. Naloxone is like an opioid antidote. I cautiously say that if you've ever heard about it. You can, in theory, you can reverse somebody's opioid overdose with this drug. You can get it as a community member. You don't, you, you, you don't need training for it. You don't have to be certified. And we gave it 1,400 times last year within the city of Winnipeg. That's a huge problem, right? The reason why we're giving it so much is because the illicit street drug scene that's coming in is just that deadly. We have to provide huge amounts of that antidote to these patients. So we'll change it up in a minute to talk about methamphetamine, but the criminal analogs of fentanyl, which means they take the master recipe of fentanyl and they change some of those chemical compounds, which means they can import those ingredients and they start pumping out criminal analogs of fentanyl, which means they're not designed to be used by human beings, people. These are deadly substances that are being bastardized from a legitimate fentanyl recipe. They're seeing it right now in Vancouver there's street analogs of fentanyl that are instantly killing people and we can't do anything for these patients, nothing. They're going to die. So anecdotally, all I can say is I would imagine those analogs will start making their way east. That's extremely scary, okay? Uh, if you remember these, you're, you've had lots of birthdays, <laughs> okay? These were advertisements that they would typically put in newspapers and magazines. And thank God we've evolved where we're now all equal. Shocking, right? But they would typically pick on women because they, back in the day, they were typically stay-at-home wives and moms. So they would pick on them by saying, this will give you more energy, make you more attractive, make you a better wife, a better mom. Take drugs like amphetamine. And they would encourage you to take amphetamine-based drugs. Um, that's a New York City advertisement encouraging people to take methadrine which is a form of methamphetamine. Not the meth of 2020, there's a big difference from the 1940s methamphetamine, but that one basically says for those of you who eat too much or if you feel depressed, take methadrine. That's absolutely disgusting. Maybe we just didn't know better back in 1930 and 1940. So thank God we've evolved, right? Meth is the most powerful sti stimulant on the market today. And I know that's why lots of you came here today uh, it's the polar opposite to drugs like fentanyl and benzos, right? The most powerful stimulant. It was developed in about 1893. Pretty interesting. It was a Japanese chemist that was working in his lab and he kind of went poof and created amphetamine. Uh, if you hear the word amphetamine versus methamphetamine, they're much the same. Methamphetamine will permeate the blood-brain barrier much quicker. That's why we use methamphetamine, but they're much the same. When you hear um, shows from the States, they refer to everything as meth, or pardon me, amphetamines. It's actually methamphetamine. It's just a slang that they started to use down there. They widely used it in World War II. I'll give you a little bit of history of what this drug is. Um, I always say war is disgusting, but it makes sense. They would give it to their soldiers. The Americans used it, the Japanese used it, the Germans used it, and they would provide essentially what was called pervitin back in the day to these soldiers and they were told to go off and keep popping these pills and fight. And it kind of made sense because it made them at times very violent, very aggressive, and they didn't have to eat, sleep, or rest. They just marched forward and they killed. So again, awful, but it kind of makes sense in that um, time of war, okay? Anybody like what they see? <laughs> 
If you're humans, yes. It's a little early. I know everybody's still getting the sleep out of their eyes, but typically you like what you see. And again, when I talk in front of a big group of people, a lot of you did what most human beings do when I put that picture up. You heard some giggling. A lot of you shifted in your seat and you, you, you maybe didn't notice that. There's lots of smiles and some whispering. And the reason why is you just activated the reward system of your brain. Just from looking at a stupid picture, <laughs> your, your, your brain is poking you that you like something about that. I'm an English boy. I, I like desserts. I have to be careful. Mine's the chocolate cake. So what's happening is you activate that reward system of your brain and you release a little bit of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. You can call that your happy chemical. So it's pretty amazing. Your brain remembers moments of pleasure and it timestamps that moment. And you think about a pleasurable moment and you start getting poked. Methamphetamine works on the same part of your brain. It targets the reward center of your brain. So meth is not chocolate cake, right? I understand that. But it's interesting how it works on that same part of your brain. And when you look at people that are struggling with substance use disorders, I don't want you to go away today and think that I'm the guy that says, we can all have a hug and light a nice campfire and sing kumbaya and everything is great. I'm not suggesting that. But you have to be sensitive to the fact that the overwhelming majority of people struggling with addiction is absolutely caused by typically horrific personal trauma. And you cannot lose sight of that fact. Again, it does not negate if you break the law, you do something bad, you hurt somebody, the police should be able to arrest you and hold you accountable. I'm not saying you should not be held accountable. But you open up your eyes and you look at that big picture and you appreciate a lot of people have that aha moment in their life where you can go back and say that's when they fell off the rails. I've been engaged so heavily in addictions and drug education the last six years, I've been humbled beyond belief. When you take three or four or five minutes and you sit down with somebody and you say, what's your story? You'll instantly be humbled and most of society does not do that. People in uniform don't do that enough and the public don't do that enough because we don't care because we're insensitive and we couldn't be bothered with these people. And that's a shame. If you sat down and you said, what's your story? It does not take long. You'll start to appreciate what their story is. And you'll start to hear of stories of horrific abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, generational poverty, generational abuse, societies that continue to be beaten down, family addiction, you, you name it. You start to find out what some of these stories are. And I'll tell you about three stories towards the end of it that'll probably humble you um, a little bit okay I'm not perfect very close <laughs> but uh, we're all human beings have have I been an asshole sure because I'm human and I'm trying to correct that by spreading that word to say sit down for three minutes and ask ask them what their story is okay so it targets the reward center of your brain and you release huge amounts of serotonin and dopamine from methamphetamine so if you're clinically depressed, you go off to your family physician and he or she will give you a serotonin uptake medication, which basically takes your serotonin and jacks it up so you're happier. And that's a good thing. So if you look at methamphetamine and you've been given a really crappy deck of cards in life and you're addicted, they turn to methamphetamine because it suppresses a lot of stuff that they have to deal with because it provides so much dopamine and serotonin, they don't have to think about typically what they're struggling with, okay? Who thinks you try meth and you're addicted after that first time? Okay, so again, there's some hands doing this and that's fine. I used to think that and they've debunked that. It's the, the addiction rate to it is brutally fast and very, very difficult but they've debunked it after the first time. That was essentially one of the scare tactics that they used to use to, so you don't use methamphetamine. And that's a bad message because if you say to people, you try meth once or twice and you're done for life, that's not fair. You're removing all hope that these people may have to actually recover from this drug. Can you recover from meth addiction? You can, but it is unbelievably difficult. The problem if you abuse methamphetamine, your brain actually stops producing dopamine for you. 
is you're stimulating that production for it. So that part of your brain kind of switches off and you stop producing dopamine. And life does not exist without dopamine. I cannot stress that enough. Um, they've proven for the addicted methamphetamine brain to reset itself, to start producing normal amounts of dopamine could take as long as two years. What do we do with these people? If, if I'm addicted to methamphetamine and I stop right now, and you guys all support me and I can get treatment, that may take two years of being off of methamphetamine for my, for my brain to kind of reset and start producing normal dopamine levels. It's an absolute monster. So you can recover. I met a girl at a conference uh, from Toronto a little while ago and the last person on the planet you would ever think went down that methamphetamine road. She was a student at, in, um, in Toronto studying to be a brain surgeon smartest of the smartest of the smartest and her and her friends couldn't keep up right they had to keep up with the joneses so to speak so they started to use cocaine a little bit the last group you would think would ever do that the cocaine wasn't cutting it they said let's just try a little bit of methamphetamine to push us through the weekend so we can study and do well well that controlled matthew so to speak which is a, a bit of a farce to itself started to turn into let's do meth on Fridays and Mondays and you know what Wednesdays are getting really tough too and before you know it they're out of school and they're now addicted to methamphetamine um, she fell into the sex trade incredible brain surgeon student addicted sex trade worker and she her story is amazing she recovered completely and she's back in school it's a phenomenal story so again it's not just the people that you think are using methamphetamine Every city that I've been to, there's a group of professionals that look just like you guys that are convinced they can use a bit of meth on the weekends to push them through. So they can keep up with the Joneses and look like everything is successful and everything's grand. Good luck with that. Anybody that knows this drug knows you will not be able to control your meth use to just one night a week. It just does not happen, okay? Um, I'm gonna nerd out a little bit. I think this stuff is really interesting. We'll talk about what dopamine release looks like. So when you eat, feels good. When we gather around families and friends, you typically surround yourself with food. And why do you think that is? It's not because you're necessarily hungry. Food brings happiness. When you eat your favorite food, you go home tonight, you open up that bag of chips, you know they're bad for you, so you're only gonna have maybe two handfuls, right? That doesn't happen. Before you know it, that friggin' bag is empty. And then you feel guilty. <laughs> But what you've been doing is actually subconsciously riding that dopamine high. You release about 150 units of dopamine every time you eat. And you look at your favorite food and you're releasing dopamine as you're eating. So you're kind of riding that food high. When they say people can become addicted to food, it's actually very, very real. Again, it doesn't excuse some of the behavior all the time, but that's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay. Video games and social media and cell phones and iPads. This is a real big one for me. Um, I don't parent parents. Um, I'm not a perfect dad. Actually, yeah, I am. I'm the world's best dad. Uh, my son's 12 and he's phenomenal. I don't know where he gets it from. He has not been raised to be demanding of these stupid devices. They have a place in society, absolutely. I spoke at a high school the other week and I think the principal is left with the impression that these are just the absolute devil's message. I'm not saying that. There's a place for the technology, but we're demanding it way too often. If you can't put this down yourself for 20 minutes or two hours or 10 hours or one or two days, ask yourself, why do you need to constantly be accessing this device? When you look at a restaurant, I, I go off on a bit of a tangent here, but you look at families, they're often not engaged at all. They're often sitting down just doing this. They're not talking, they're just engaged on the cell phone. If your child is being a bit of a pain in the ass, a lot of people throw your cell phone at them and say, just go away and shut up for a little bit, right? And that's super concerning because if we raise these kids on these devices, their brains are not developed. Your brain is developing till you're about 25, maybe even 28 years old. So if they're constantly demanding that hit of dopamine, They've shown this can release up to 175 units of dopamine. Every time you play that game or you check that status, 
or you feel acknowledged or vindicated from social media, we're all guilty of it, it feels good. <coughs> and they're constantly accessing these devices. So what happens to that developing kid's brain when all of a sudden they lose that device for a week or two? Because they're on a holiday or because they've been bad. So you say, I'm gonna take your iPad away for two weeks. How, how do you think they're gonna fill that void? I'm not saying they're gonna go use methamphetamine for God's sake, but they're, they're, that's concerning. Kids are expecting their dopamine to always be riding high from social media and video games. So just quietly ask yourself, what is your limit? Especially with your kids. It's new research that's extremely um, worrisome, okay? I went to Florida last year to the never ending Disney lineup and we're looking around laughing engaged and almost everybody is just doing this, shuffling down the line. I couldn't believe it. It's like a, like a, a total zombie takeover, right? Just incredible. Smoking about 200 units of dopamine. Um, a healthy sex life. Healthy sex life gives you about 200 points and I will not share a picture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's interesting about this one, so I, I really have to stress a healthy sex life. Um, I work with the exploited girls and women in our city, uh, and I'm <coughs> super humbled that I'm able to work with these girls. Um, they keep on asking me back, and that's very humbling being a man, right? To put their guard down to trust a man is a huge step. So I'm extremely honored that I'm, I'm able to do this. And what's disgusting is we run about four classes a year for up to 20 or 30 girls per class. You guys do the math. That's appalling. That's anywhere from 80 to 120 girls and women a year that they're trying to pull out, out of that sex trade and program and educate them and love them and try and give them a future. So I thought about pulling this slide when I provide the education to them. I wasn't sure how I wanted to handle that. And I kept it in, and when they gain your trust, they've actually got some real good like, kind of jokes about this, if you can believe it. Um, but you find out what their story is, again, and you'll be humbled beyond belief. It's not just the girls and women that you think it is. We're dealing with a girl from Charleswood right now. You all know where Charleswood is? It's a nice part of Winnipeg where people have the blinders on. It never happens in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, we have the disluxury as uniform people, just like police do. We go into these suburban type neighborhoods and the rural communities and we see the addiction. <coughs> but it's being hidden in these million dollar homes in Royal Wood and Tuxedo and Charleswood. You're not going to see these people struggling with addiction stumbling down their street because they because they have a home to hide it. So this girl's from Charleswood, uh, beautiful family, engaged parents, love their daughter, and this is not a nice story. And I usually start by saying it's not gonna be a super nice hour spent with me. Um, if you need to talk to somebody after, make sure you do that. That's a message that I usually relay to, to young people, but that goes for anybody. Um, this girl was about 13 or 14 years old, and she met this wonderful man, right? masters of their craft. She meets this guy, she's a young girl, he offers her protection, buys her nice things, gives her money, makes her feel very important. Starts to give her some drugs, gets her addicted to cocaine very, very quickly, which is often their choice drug. He's a good man, so he's not gonna charge her for the drugs, right? He starts giving her large amounts of cocaine because he's such a good man, and he says, I'm gonna give you this nice, beautiful brick of cocaine. I'm not going to charge you because I love you and I'm a good person. You can use half, you have to sell the other half though. He knows she's not going to sell it because she's addicted to that drug now. He does that a few times um, and comes back to her and now says, you owe me $60,000. They know exactly what they're doing. And she's a 13 or 14 year old child that owes this. I'm going to watch my language because apparently I'm being videotaped. <laughs> This piece of trash says, you owe me 60 grand. I don't have 60 grand. He says, yeah, I know. He says, you have a little sister that I might kill. Um, or you can go to this address, they'll take some pictures of you, and you can start paying off your debt, you piece of meat. She's embedded in that sex trade. She doesn't have a choice. She's addicted, and she knows this guy could kill her sister. 
maybe he'll kill her mom. She's terrified. So she's embedded in that sex trade. And the problem is, is there's a lineup of disgusting, filthy men that are waiting for their turn. That's the biggest problem. So my interpretation of that is you need to get these girls off the street, give them a hope and give them a chance and hammer the filthy men that are demanding that service. I love about five minutes alone with some of those guys. I would love it, okay? So it's not always the people that you think, right? Some of these kids that are within the system, you all know what the system is. When they age out, when they're 18 years old, who do you think is waiting for them to offer them protection and buy them stuff and give them food and give them shelter? They know exactly what they're doing. You've got this broken young girl that has nobody and nothing. And these men come along and they give them that protection and they make them feel that, you know, validated. And they're embedded in that sex trade. So it makes you kind of realize cocaine, very strong drug, about 450 units of dopamine. Uh, what do you think methamphetamine gives you? What do you think is that percentage or those units of dopamine? Just throw out some numbers. A thousand plus. A thousand plus. That's some strong stuff. Okay. It's actually quite right. It's about 1,300 units. So you go back and you look at cocaine, kind of the drug of choice for a long time. It doesn't even touch methamphetamine. Human beings are not anywhere near designed to accept and sustain 1300 units of dopamine not designed for that so imagine that pleasure you feel with whatever you want to think about it pales in comparison to methamphetamine so that's why a lot of these people turn to it and the problem with methamphetamine is the first time or two you try it you get as high as you ever possibly can and then it's impossible to ever get that high again humanly impossible so they struggle to say that first couple of times I use that drug, my only focus is to get back to that point and you humanly can't. That's why they start to binge and aggressively take the drug because they need that dopamine production and they can't get it. That's the one substance that does that to the brain. Humanly impossible to ever get that high again. These are probably an issue here to a point I would imagine. Okay, they're all over the city of Winnipeg. Um, nobody can deny there's a concentration in our city core. You'd be, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't the case, but it's everywhere. Addiction and substance use disorders do not have boundaries or barriers. They don't care what you look like. Doesn't matter where you're from or your skin color. It affects everybody. And the problem with meth is you'll snort it, swallow it, smoke it, or inject it. The vast majority of methamphetamine users are injecting the drug with needles. Um, I have engaged a ton of meth users and sometimes they'll start with sm uh, swallowing meth pills or, or they'll smoke the, um, uh, the crystal version of it. It doesn't last long. They turn to the needle very, very quickly. And usually when you inhale a substance, that actually gives you a much quicker high. Meth is quite different. <coughs> Methamphetamine users say nothing beats the needle. So they immediately turn to the needle. Um, I talked to a little grandmother the other day that got a hold of me somehow through the department and she said I'm worried about my neighbors they must be a diabetic using insulin because there's needles all over the back lane <laughs> so I said oh come here grandma I, I gave her some knowledge to say is not because people are injecting insulin okay um, the second needle on the bottom has been bent and that's pretty pretty amazing to me because these people remember they are still human beings they're injecting the drug they're not happy people, trust me. I've never met a person that's addicted, especially to methamphetamine, that's happy. They acutely know what they're doing. But it's incredible, some of them inject the drug, they stab in the ground and they bend it. So the next person cannot use that needle. Yes, they're disposing of it inappropriately, I understand that, but it's pretty amazing that they still have the foresight to think of some harm reduction for the next person. So we're, we're seeing more of this in uh, Winnipeg. I would like to see them disposing of them appropriately more, um, but it's still pretty, pretty incredible. That's kind of what meth looks like. Um, the girls I work with and the women I work with, I, I can't show them this picture. It's a huge trigger for a lot of them, right? And when I talk to even to high schools and community groups, I often caution people. I didn't think I had to do that here today, 
by looking at methamphetamine or even just a syringe for people that are addicted or are trying to recover is a huge trigger. Um, so again, that's kind of what it looks like. I can probably put up 30 or 40 different pictures of methamphetamine and they're all just a little bit different. So again, if the subject matter experts are saying, please don't think you can look at a dime bag or a foil bag or whatever and tell me what that is for certainty. You can't. You, you can say it's probably meth, it's maybe cocaine, it's maybe heroin, but it has to be sent for testing, okay? Most of the meth that I've seen looks like the middle one, sort of dirty broken glass, sometimes the bottom right one, more white broken glass. Um, the problem is meth is meth is meth, no matter what it looks like. If it's a beautiful crystal blue ocean meth, like the one on the left, or like the show uh, Breaking Bad, right? The Breaking Bad show was a methamphetamine show where this guy was pumping out methamphetamine. Doesn't matter what it looks like, it's the same list of ingredients. I talked to a small time manufacturer and dealer from Winnipeg that was in this program we're in, and in the summertime she would dig a hole in her backyard and throw a bunch of chemicals into it and start pumping out dirty meth. In the winter time she used her toilet. She would throw a bunch of chemicals into her toilet and start pumping out garbage meth and people were buying this stuff. One of the first ingredients they use is typically acid. So they'll go take sometimes a big uh, commercial battery, they'll crack open the top, they dump all the battery acid into a mixing vat. Seeing pseudoephedrine, cough medicine, I've seen Drano, brake fluid, WD-40, gasoline, um, farm fertilizer, and a lot of red match heads. They'll actually cut the match heads off because the red phosphorus reacts with some of those chemicals. I'm not a chemist but they need that red phosphorus. That's what meth is. So if you guys go back home today and you have a nice big glass of battery acid, you don't do that because it's gonna dissolve you from the inside out. That's what meth does to the human body. It slowly will dissolve you from the inside out, okay? Um, kind of scooped by most of this stuff. Again, not really my shtick, but um, I'm heavily connected with Winnipeg Police, got a phenomenal partnership with them. We're not super acutely worried about meth labs anymore. We would respond with the police clan lab team. Um, not a huge concern anymore. Um, and more of a police wheelhouse, but you're not able to compete with that foreign market. For pricing, and I hate to say it, but that quality. I hate saying quality in meth within the same sentence, but they just can't compete. Um, meth is extraordinarily cheap. You may ask, why are people doing it? Well, I think I've explained the addictive qual uh, qualities of it. And meth is brutally cheap. Cocaine is not cheap. Opioids are not cheap. Uh, meth can be anywhere from free to three bucks per point to five or 10 bucks per point. And a lot of these people can maintain their high for maybe two points a day. Not very much money, right? So again, paramedic, not my wheelhouse, but when you're wondering why I can only speak to Winnipeg. Why is your kid's bike being stolen? Why is your shed being broken into? Why is there an increase in property crime? I can only say anecdotally, we all know it's a lot to do with, <coughs> with these patients that are using methamphetamine because it's just that cheap. They can steal my kid's bike and sell it for five bucks maybe for the metal. And that's their, that's their point of meth. Okay? When I say free, because these are usually good people, right? I'm a good person. I'm gonna give you a little bit to try. Well, you know exactly why they do that. You're gonna come back to them, right? Um, effects of meth, just give those a quick breeze. I'm not gonna read through them for time's sake, uh, but just give them a, a real uh, quick breeze. Um, essentially, again, it's imagine what those chemicals do to the human body. It's abnormal when we're seeing nationally or internationally younger people with aneurysms and strokes and kidney failure. Um, they're concerned that's what methamphetamine does, does to the human body. Okay. Uh, some of the effects, you can see it, euphoria, dysphoria, self-confidence, and social ability. If you're a person that, again, has been dealt a horrific deck of cards in life, this kind of does a good job of pushing those things away, doesn't it? You're, you're, you deal with that euphoria, that dysphoria, and you don't really have to face some of the realities of your life when you're using this stuff. What is dysphoria? <laughs> so dysphoria, I would say, similar to euphoria, where it's a disconnect from reality, okay? 
Overdoser for long use, again, just give those a bit of a read. Has everybody heard of meth psychosis here? Or how about methamphetamine and violent people? Yes, you've all heard about that. You have to be careful with that because again, when you watch the news, you watch the shows, you hear the stories, you think everybody that uses meth is violent. That's not true. It's actually a relatively low percentage of methamphetamine users will become violent. I, I won't minimize meth-induced psychosis. I'll talk more about it in a minute. It's extremely scary. But please don't think everybody on meth is a murderous animal waiting to chop your head off. That's not the reality. Okay? Again, I've engaged a ton of these folks, and a lot of them, they're not violent. They know what they're doing is not right, is not good, and they're asking for help. Um, when you do see meth-induced psychosis, um, that's the best picture I can come up with. <laughs> Um, you have to call 911. You cannot talk these people down. If you see it in your community, I can only speak to Winnipeg. I don't know what ability your paramedics have rurally. We have some, some, pretty, some pretty amazing treatments in the city. You have to call 911. And the, the, the Mounties present will know this. These people have amazing superhuman strength. Like you will not believe. They do not feel pain. They don't feel pain. We had a guy with a fractured humerus. This is a pretty crazy story. He had a, a fractured arm through and through. He was in a meth-induced uh, psychotic state where he was actually beating the other person with his fractured arm. They don't feel pain. So when you look at this, I'm gonna go on a tangent here. I'm a paramedic. But when you look at this anti-police sentiment that's traveling across the country, shame on people that are thinking that way. Shame on you. They look at a police shooting, there's been a ton within the city of Winnipeg. Why do you think that is? They don't feel pain, they're super strong, and sometimes a police taser does nothing to these people. I've had some friends in Winnipeg that have had to discharge their firearm and kill somebody. That's not nice. They don't have any other line of defense. I've been tased twice in my life. Uh, I went to a party last year, got in some trouble, and I was tased. That's awkward. I'm joking. It was for training. <laughs> that was super quiet. <laughs> Very awkward moment, right? There's this professional that's been tased. Um, I was in Dallas, Texas <coughs> years ago for my tactical training. And for two weeks, I got shot with bean bags, tased, pepper sprayed, and gassed. It was super fun. <laughs> If you've ever been hit with a taser, it is horrific. <laughs> horrific. And I've seen some of these people walk right through that police taser and they just keep coming at you. So my heart goes out to law enforcement everywhere. They're in a tough position, you guys, with these folks. There is no antidote for methamphetamine and there's no replacement therapy. When I travel the country, people still tell me, just give them the antidote. <laughs> There is no antidote for methamphetamine, and there is no replacement therapy. If you're addicted to opioids, the health system can give you an opioid replacement therapy. Suboxone or methadone, excellent program, not for meth, okay? Um, so there are hallucinations and paranoia and their delusions. No matter who you are, I don't care how many letters you have after your name, you can't talk these people down. They've proven that. I presented with psychiatrists and psychologists and addictions experts and they all say the same thing. You can't talk them down, okay? So make sure you're accessing 911. Um, a little guy that I dealt with, I haven't been on the street for years since I promoted, I guess, but this little guy that I dealt with was shorter than I am, <coughs> maybe 120 pounds. He was no physical threat to me. And he was a very cooperative methamphetamine patient that wanted help. Yep, come in the ambulance, I assessed him, and I could tell from his body language that he was starting to change a bit, right? From experience, you can sometimes forecast some body changes. And this guy, remember, he looked right through me and he said, you're the antichrist, I'm gonna murder you right now. I thought, oh, my shift was almost over, man. I needed 15 more minutes and I was <laughs> off my shift. So he found his way out of my ambulance very quickly and I remember it took four police officers, my partner and I, just to pin this little guy down. He was almost, literally almost throwing us through the air. Incredible strength. Um, so please take that seriously, okay? Um, a lot of meth patients are obsessed with bugs crawling under their skin. 
It's a bit of a phenomenon to meth. They don't have bugs crawling under their skin. I've seen people will literally pull their bodies apart to try and pull these bugs out. And they don't have bugs crawling under their skin, okay? Uh, we're only gonna focus on the, on the rush stage. The other ones are not very, very important. The rush means you take the drug and you get flooded with dopamine and serotonin like I talked about before. That flood of neurotransmitters only lasts about 20 or 30 minutes. And it starts to come down about 20 or 30 minutes later. So the focus on these users is only to get to that rush stage. No matter what stage they're in, they wanna get back to the rush. So they start to binge and constantly take that methamphetamine. Like any other drug, you build up a very fast tolerance to it, just like an Advil or a Tylenol. If you take enough Advil, you need more of it because you build up that tolerance. Methamphetamine is really much the same, okay? The different stages, a lot of the people that are tweaking, as they call it, I would probably say that's where you're going to encounter them out in the community, where they're becoming hyper desperate, they're hyper, hyper paranoid, they're unable to reach that level of high, so they start to tweak, they become extremely desperate, they either can't get their fix, can't get their drug, it's not good enough math, whatever. And you'll maybe start to see some of these folks becoming extremely desperate for that next hit, okay? That's like any other substance or uh, drug out there that crash, and then you start to withdraw, much, much like everything else. Uh, the treatment we're providing in Winnipeg, um, olanzapine is an antipsychotic drug. Um, we started providing this drug last January of 19. Um, so we want to catch these people before they hit that meth-induced state. The antipsychotic drug, we, we now give about sometimes twice a day within Winnipeg. That's terrible. There's no way we should be doing an administration of olanzapine up to twice a day. Winnipeg's big, it's not that big. Um, that drug works quite well. It reduces your anxiety, reduces some of the paranoia that you feel, usually results in a much happier hospital when, when we deliver them to the hospital. And we're trying to show there's an increased hospital stay when we have this drug on board. And that's a good thing. Because a lot of people with addiction will be brought to the hospital with either uh, paramedics or police, and they're right back out. They don't want to wait around for four, six, or eight hours. If we can give them the antipsychotic drug and reduce their symptoms, we're trying to show there's an increased risk, increased length of hospital stay, which means hopefully they, they can access services and not just be right out. Yep. Can you give this to them at any stage of what uh, the previous slide, the rush, the high, the... Yes. So at any point in that? Yep, yep, so, so very good question. So the question is at what stage do we give this in? Basically any stage where we acknowledge their anxiety and their paranoia is super, super high, we can offer to give them this drug, which means we have to ask them, can I give you a medication that's gonna minimize some of your symptoms? It's all in the approach, right? If they're not willing to take that drug, uh, advanced care paramedics, which I can only speak to Winnipeg, I don't think rural paramedics can do this, I don't know, uh, we will chemically sedate you. And that's where we can caught two very strong drugs together. We inject you with these drugs if you want it or not, and we just chemically sedate you. That's the only line of defense for these folks. So we want the olanzapine on board. If it doesn't work or they don't take it, we're gonna sedate you. And in my time on the street, in Winnipeg, we would chemically sedate people anecdotally, maybe six times a year. It's extremely rare. Whether you're in a psychotic state for a variety of reasons, or if you get out of the bar at three in the morning and you're just being an ass, maybe I will chemically sedate you. <laughs> um, but not that often. Now, we're seeing chemical sedations about one every day and a half or two in our city. And I can say with confidence that's because of methamphetamine, for, for sure. Um, now don't forget, you may have a hard time determining if a mental health patient is a methamphetamine user. And that's a bit of miss on society, is as soon as people see somebody acting bizarrely or impaired, maybe they're having a mental health crisis. You really can't determine what's wrong with that person. A lot of people see these folks and they, ah, oh, meth user. Not necessarily. There's a lot of mental health conditions that can mimic some of these signs and symptoms. Okay, and it really takes a very experienced, trained professional to acknowledge what that difference is. And it's sometimes very, very difficult. Okay, so to give a shout out to people struggling with mental health disorders, which is a, a terrible, 
uh, thing to deal with. Let's be careful we're not labeling everybody that's acting bizarrely as a meth user, okay? Uh, some of the challenges, um, all I can really say is sometimes we're being very aggressive with these people and we will not apologize for that. There's, again, our only line of defense is to get on them. And that's dangerous for us. It's dangerous for the paramedics and it's dangerous for police. There's no humane dart gun, which I say with a bit of humor, but partially serious. If we're chemically sedating these people, I in all seriousness wonder if we'll evolve to more of a chemical sedation type of dart gun, seriously. Because for anybody to get into their space is extraordinarily dangerous, okay? Uh, sometimes it's hard because if you come to me, I'm gonna correct that, if you come to us, I should never say me or I, that's terrible. If you come to a provider and say, I want help, if somebody's struggling with addiction and they ask for help, if you don't catch them in that tiny little window, you're likely gonna lose them. They've proven that. Somebody that's addicted, that's ready for help, if you can't offer them phenomenal, compassionate, long-term care in that moment, you're likely gonna lose them. And what happens, and I'll get in trouble at some point, and I frankly, I don't care. I've been doing this long enough and I'm a confident enough guy with my messaging. If the system is in place where she comes to me for help, I take her to the hospital or please take her to the hospital. What do you think happens when they say we have no room, there's no beds, or do you have 150 grand to go off to the mountains for treatment? They're not coming back. If you're told to come back in four, six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, because we have no room, these people are probably not gonna come back. And that's super heartbreaking. I've been that person where parents have literally pounded on my chest in anger because they can't access care for their child. I've seen it countless times in our city. So you have to be careful that you don't make it about you, be it police or paramedics. I, I walk a fine line and it sometimes pisses off some of my buddies. If you see me on the news, CTV news at 6.30 tonight, whatever, and I provide a media story about poor me. I'm busy, I'm tired, we're doing so many calls, I'm getting home late, I'm not getting to the cottage on time. That's an insult to people dealing with substance use disorder, and that's an insult to families that have lost loved ones to some of these poisons. So right, you have to walk a very fine line. There's some union messaging where they have to look out for their members, that's fine. I never do that. Because I don't know who I'm talking to, and I don't want to insult somebody that's currently dealing with it. My friend is a prime example. They lost their amazing child to an accidental overdose. He doesn't want to look at somebody's job in a uniform and hear poor me. They want answers and they want help for their kids. Okay? Uh, these are our math responses in Winnipeg. It's 768 and 17 and almost 1,500 last year. Um, and a, a, again, like I apologize, I, I don't have rural data. They, they need to work on their data collection. <laughs> um, but that's that's terrible. I, I know that methamphetamine bar is not plateauing. There's no way. It's not plateauing. It's not going down. This has got a pretty pretty good hold of us. So that's 1,500 times last year when paramedics dealt with the methamphetamine incident in the city of Winnipeg. Um, we've had about a 2,000 percent increase in our meth responses from 2015. 2,000 percent. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of bar graphs and stuff, but the emergency rooms used to see 15 meth patients a month. They now see over 207 meth patients a month in our city. So I don't know what you guys are, exper are experiencing here locally. It's a real big problem in our city. Um, and when you talk about um, some of the numbers, that's from the police conference I was at, that's right from Canada Health. You're gonna see the common word in that messaging is fentanyl. Fentanyl is aggressively being found in lots of different substances on the street. Fentanyl, fentanyl, fentanyl. So make sure you're not losing focus on that. Okay? Oh, five more minutes. Actually, my helmet. I think it's about 10 after 11, right? Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're almost done. So that's kind of a, a bit of an interesting slide. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. Um, when you go back to this slide and you look at 207 patients, a month and you think about who you think is addicted and who you think is using substances and this is not just for methamphetamine now what I'm going to talk about 
there's not 207 people living beneath the Main Street Bridge. Right? And I say that because a lot of society has their heads so far shoved up their butts where they think it's never going to happen to me. It doesn't happen to my family. I'm better than that. I am, maybe I'm, I'm educated. I'm a professional. It doesn't happen in my neighborhood. You've got huge naive blinders on if you think this is not happening all over the city. And when I say city, I can talk to the rural communities and, you know, provincially. Um, so real big issue. And when I talk about how uh, the issues of, of addiction and substance use don't have boundaries, I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. Um, I grew, my younger years, I grew up in Churchill, Manitoba, actually. I'm, I'm a northern boy. Uh, so my heart is still up in the north. But I can tell you one of the, the highlight of my career was three months ago when the indigenous community approached me and, and wanted to partner with me. Um, that's the highlight of my career. It tells me I'm doing something right because that community will not welcome you with open arms if you're not providing the messaging for the right reason, if you're not compassionate. And if I'm towing the city of Winnipeg company line and I'm providing some stock, you know, produced presentation, they're, they're not gonna be interested in that. Um, so the highlight of my career is when they came to me to partner. They've been watching me for about two or three years, it turns out, to figure me out. And then that partnership was asked. That's incredible. I'm going to be able to travel to all the northern remote communities with that partnership, standing shoulder to shoulder, providing the same message that you're getting here today. And that's pretty unique to have somebody in uniform talking about personal trauma and compassion and generational trauma. It's very, very unique. Um, a couple of quick stories. A guy that we dealt with in Winnipeg um, that was addicted to everything, everything on our planet. Um, and society threw him out. He was a bag of trash to society because he was a homeless man and he smelt. So society threw him out. And uh, this was a guy that we dealt with for a super long time. He's, he's long dead. And he was the smelliest, dirtiest human being I've ever dealt with in my entire career. We're treating him one day and out of his pocket falls his World War II vet card. What a humbling moment. Society threw him out like a bag of trash. He was an indigenous fighter from World War II that fought for the country that we all enjoy today. And what did society do to that man? Threw him out because he was homeless and he smelt. And, and they had a stereotypical notion of what those people do. No understanding of who he was or what he did. Because society didn't take the two or three minutes to say, what's your story? And find out what his story is. That vet card was immaculate. He was so proud of that. He never advertised it, but it was immaculate. And every time I present this information, I say to everybody, it's not just about you. If you don't know the history of the returning indigenous fighters from World War II, shame on you. You take 10 minutes and you find out what their history is and you'll be instantly humble. They returned from the war to fight for your country and they were thrown out. Piss off and go back to your reserve. That's appalling beyond belief. So you start to have a perspective on sometimes some of those struggles and you find out what their stories are. So when I was approached by that community with wide open arms, super, super humbling. Um, second story was a guy we dealt with for quite some time on the strip in Winnipeg, that's Main Street. Another guy that was homeless and he didn't fit the mold of that lifestyle though. Like there's some, I have a lot of experience. There was something off with this guy. Like, man, I, I don't think this guy fits. There's something off. He was a guy we would take to the hospital. He would put his mouth beneath the hand sanitizer and fill his mouth full. He would take anything he could possibly get. And my humbling moment in my career was this. I got sick and tired of him. I, I didn't take that moment to say, what's your story? I didn't care. I was done dealing with him. I didn't want to see him again. I was pissed off because I fell into that kind of trap, right, of just not caring. And we put this guy's story together. He looked at me one day and he said, I'm, I'm already completely destroyed. He's a guy that would stand on the corner with a sign granted and society would do what? They would chuck garbage in his face. They would chuck pennies in his face when we still had pennies. And they would tell him, get a job, you bum, right? 
you loser, you junkie, you addict, get a job, you friggin' loser. And they threw him out. And I'm gonna get through the punchline. I've told this story so many times. It humbled me when we put this guy's story together. He was a very successful man from Vancouver, British Columbia, that found his way living on the streets of Winnipeg when he gets a phone call one day at work that his two kids and wife were killed in a devastating car accident. And how do you think this guy treated that trauma? He started drinking. Started drinking alcohol, phenomenal family man. Lost his entire bloodline. Two kids and wife gone. Lost his job drinking, started to use drugs, couldn't treat the trauma, ended up on the streets of Winnipeg. Massively humbling moment for me. So again, you look at, those are pretty big examples. When you start to ask people stories and you find out, you should be humble and that should pull said head out of said butt <laughs> and realize that everybody has a story and you have to be sensitive to that fact. Okay? That's kind of it. I hope you guys learned something. Um, fire away with any questions now. Or okay. One thing I'd actually like to ask is, if I recall, you had an estimated percentage of psychosis. Yep. Can you share that? Yep. So when we talk about methamphetamine, uh, we're finding approximately 10% of methamphetamine users are labeled as being violent. So that gives you a pretty good idea. The vast majority are non-violent. Okay, now for us in the city, that's still high, because if we're doing 2,000 of these responses every year, that's still a couple of hundred times a year where, where the paramedics are saying, holy crap, right? Like we are pulling off a high number of weapons off of people now. <coughs> Hatchets, axes, knives, guns, you name it. Um, the potential's there, but the potential is very low. Okay? Yep. I'm yeah, just wondering, in, uh, back to that uh, cannabis being laced with, uh, with meth, is that something that's going to be the future? I don't think so. No. Um, again, the work that I do with police, and I'll be careful to walk my wheelhouse, but it, it doesn't make any sense for that street level to add expensive drugs to, to cannabis. And what the message was, was marijuana had fentanyl in it. That was not true. Yeah. It makes no sense for them to, to it, it, it's poor business to take expensive drugs and dust their cheap supply of cannabis with it. It just does not make sense. Okay, I just thought for the, for the sake of getting people hooked. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you have a group of people that use cannabis that will only use cannabis. They're, they're not interested in these higher type, type drugs. Okay. Like when we talk about cannabis being legal, I said last night that I'm a guy that has to cover up the badges when I say this, but I supported it being legal. And that's from a health perspective. I, I said that at a high school and everybody applauded and think, oh my God, no. These, these kids are gonna go back to their parents and say, there's this super cool paramedic man. He said, I can come home and play video games and smoke my brains out. No, you, you missed the point. It has clear defined health benefits. Nobody can deny that. It has health benefits and if you can provide that supply and make it controlled and safe, I think that's a step in the right direction. Because cannabis is heavily used, you guys. We all know that. If you can make that supply safe and tax the bejesus out of it, yeah. and then you take that money and you provide aggressive treatment and education, that would be a step in the right direction. Like it was Colorado, the first couple of years they had something like $250 million from taxes from the sales of it. Let's capture that tax money and provide programming so we can get people away from these high-end drugs. And use it properly. Yep. Use the tax money properly. Yep, correct. <laughs> certainly not certainly not my wheelhouse, but yeah. Yep. How many dopamine units in the marijuana hub? Very good question. I'm gonna have to look that one up. I'm not sure why I don't have that added to my list. The question was how many dopamine or serotonin hits from cannabis? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that one. Yep. What's your um collaboration connection with the mental health um, community when you're dealing with um, like in paramedics with someone who is schizophrenic has maybe had monthly injections so there's those kinds of medications in your system along with 
uh, methamphetamines. Right. Do you do you work with um, mental health workers as well, or? Uh, or I, connect I, in some way? I can't say we work with them directly. I can say uh, I'm not towing the company line. Winnipeg is very, very aggressive with the partnerships that we have. Do we work <coughs> directly with them? Um, we have one group of paramedics that are community paramedics in Winnipeg that are advanced care paramedics that never transport to the hospital. These are highly trained paramedics that can access services for, for those folks. So they'll respond to an incident by themselves. They never transport. They have a high level of training. They can treat, medicate, diagnose. They can suture your wound. They can treat, like if, if you have a, um, like a chest infection, they can treat that at home and not transport you to the hospital. And that would be part of that picture. If it's a frequent user of our system or there's a significant mental health component, they'll work with that mental health uh, expert and set them up with the help that they need. I would like to see it more though. Like I think we acknowledge that national standard that I'm working on collaboratively has acknowledged that we need more mental health involvement up front, right? Because to, to send a, a cruiser car or a, um, a, an ambulance with two paramedics is great. We are not mental health experts. And the vast majority of folks we deal with in the community, be it paramedicine or policing, is what? Mental health and substance use disorders. So a perfect system would be, can we have a mental health expert teamed up with those people and then piggyback on those responses? That's the perfect system to me. But then you need the system in place behind to support that person. And we're lacking that, right? There's a stigma attached to mental health and there's a stigma attached to people that are addicted and the aggressive robust help is not always there. So huge big issue that I'm, we're not gonna solve here. Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you have parents that are beating you, looking for help for their, for their kids and that. How many um, uh, units is the province lacking as far as uh, support for, for getting people help? Help. I know the province supposedly in their last budget announced that they were going to dump in a bunch of mo a money in that, but how many units are we lacking? Like is it thousands or, or hundreds or, or, or what? Not sure I can really attach a number to it. Um, I think the best way I'm going to answer that is by saying what's encouraging is there's never been so much discussion and talk and attention brought to addiction and mental health in the last couple of years. I think that's a step in the right direction. We've had lots of steering committees, lots of um, um, you know working group committees, another steering committee, another working group committee. You guys get where I'm going. Another steering committee. We've had a meeting about the meeting that we had, and then we book another meeting for the meeting we had last year. Like you kind of get what I'm saying. So to kind of you know politically protect myself, <laughs> I think we've had enough meetings, and I think we've had enough people sit at the table that we know what we have to do. Um, it's slow to react. I know the city and I don't remember, they just opened up, don't quote me on this, 10 or 20 beds specific to addiction and specific to methamphetamine. So when you say how many beds are we lacking, I can't really give you a number. We're, we're desperately lacking services though. Um, but the attention is certainly there, right? But you need to act on those recommendations from those committees. That's so typical because right? when you mention about meeting after meeting, like the Scott Oak uh, yeah. Foundation or whatever, yeah. that's been finally, I think they're they're putting the uh, building or, or they're going to start it and it's yeah. been like three or four years. At least. And it's so typical that um, it doesn't matter what form of government, uh, they seem to like to have meetings, but nothing ever gets accomplished. Yeah. And so I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. They had a fentanyl task force in, uh, 2016 that my friend sat on that lost his son and uh, they had this year-long steering committee for opioids they met and met 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 the result of that committee was bus bench signs are you kidding me he was so heartbroken so anyway I'm gonna end it Derek's gonna yank me here uh, I'm not in a rush to leave afterwards if you guys want to approach me one-on-one -on -one, that's perfectly fine and I'm looking forward to hearing some local use as well. So thank you, Corey. And I think what we want to do is there are probably going to be a few more questions after possibly for both Neil and Corey that we can actually address. Uh, I'll give him a few extra minutes, but I'd like to get Neil up right away. 
so that we don't uh, lose any opportunity to hear some things from him. Um, one thing I neglected to mention everybody, and, and I just want to let you know, you can see I, we have Jeremy uh, videotaping today. And what we're going to be doing with that is we'll be putting it on the town and the chamber feed after to make sure that anybody that is not here can see it, or if you need it as reference information later on, that you've got it. Okay? Neil, why don't you do your own bio? Great. Um, I, uh, I loathe, I'm like Corey, I loathe public speaking, so I'll have an initial wave, physiologic wave of anxiety, and it'll probably be stuttering. This is true. This is what's happening right now as I, I speak to you. So that will pass, and, and I'll get my steam. I'm just going to hand out some pamphlets. Uh, there's not enough to go around, but it's just some of the information pamphlets that I hand out in my role to folks. So feel free to just hand it back and share. My name is Neil Ives. I'm a registered nurse. Um, I came to Swan Valley in 2000, the end of 2009 as a travel nurse. Uh, I was born and raised in Vancouver, BC. And uh, in 2009, I came here. I worked in the emergency department and the uh, acute care unit for almost a couple of years. And I was quite surprised um, coming to a small community and, and perhaps a little bit naive, perhaps not, uh, just the amount of people that were coming through the emergency department uh, with, um, I guess, injuries or uh, illnesses related to substance use. So before I head off on that tangent a little bit, what's the number, the drug that causes the most harm uh, in our community, in our country today? Does anybody name that drug? Alcohol, yeah, so I know alcohol wasn't talked about today, but alcohol is still the number one killer, maimer, and destroyer of people. So um, it just happens to be legal, and we're kind of, you know, past that point of considering it in that way. Um, these other sort of more novel drugs or more sensational drugs are interesting to talk about, but we shouldn't forget about some of those, some, some of those other ones. So I came to Swan River and uh, worked a while in the emergency department, saw some of these folks coming in and out, and uh, really being treated um, not ideally from, from the lens that I see the world through. So people would come in, they'd have, say, wounds from injections or in full-blown withdrawal, and uh, oftentimes just uh, out you get. Uh, people on the unit who are admitted to the unit or trying to be admitted to the unit, uh, which is the need you know, more medical care, medical care overnight or for days and weeks, oftentimes would leave because their needs were unaddressed or we didn't do a, a great job of assessing what their true needs were or what would cause them to leave. And, and more often than not, it was uh, dependency on the substance. And again, we weren't assessing for that. So it's like, well, they left against medical advice and they're off and running. Um, but truly, it's just uh, a piece that we probably could have done a better job on. So anyways, I moved into the public health uh, department uh, in 2012. 12? Did a stint in public health. Then I did a community health nursing role, Camperville Duck Bay for a couple of years. And when I was in public health, I was trying to advocate for some outreach and some connection to the people that I was seeing coming through the emergency department, but they seemed to be across the street in front of the Nelson, and we never went to them, and they never came to public health necessarily, uh, but they were going to the emergency department. So I started to do a little bit of outreach work to folks um, who were out and about in town who I had met previously and uh, made some really good connections and started to talk to them about what their express needs were. What, what do you need from your healthcare system? What do you need from me uh, as a nurse, as a public health nurse? And they were really clear and really open. Um, again, I ended up in Camperville Duck Bay, worked there for a couple of years. One of my uh, managers called me uh, and said, Neil, you've been advocating for some harm reduction type strategies uh, you know, in and around Swan River. Uh, just to let you know, there's an HIV outbreak. Uh, and we want to talk to you about some of that stuff. Um, so when I say outbreak, it's not, you know, outbreak like in the movies. It's, uh, there's a cluster. So, so now HIV, uh, people were getting HIV from sharing injection supplies largely, um, some sexual encounters, but primarily injection supplies. So I actually worked with the medical officer of health for a, a short time in some of the planning and with my management team and with other colleagues. And I started to do, uh, the need was recognized for some outreach nursing. So I got out for uh, probably about a year and a half, two years, and all I did was based on the public health office, was marched around uh, with my backpack, uh, hand out such the ones you have here, and just trying to connect people to care and again, find out what their needs were. Uh, and it became pretty clear, people were pretty vocal. At the time, it was primarily opiates, uh, benzodiazepine dependency, prescription based, it was kind of pre-meth, this was pre pre this horrible substance meth. Um, and so they didn't have good access to care and they certainly didn't have access to any 
uh, pathways that they felt were meaningful for recovery. And one of those pathways was methadone and or suboxone. So that's what uh, was spoken of briefly. It's one of the medications that can be given to replace somebody's opiate that they're dependent on. And so we had a couple of doctors, no local doctors would take up the uh, case at the time. So we had a Dr. Lopez Gardner, who I worked with out in Camperville, and Dr. Lisa Monkman, um, both do addictions medicine training, and then came here with me, and we sort of ran this little, um, we call it the Primary Care Outreach Clinic. And it was actually in partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association. They gave us a closet space to rent, because uh, there was no space uh, anywhere else. So we rented this little room in, uh, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association office and once a week uh, we would house a clinic where I would line up a roster of people who needed to see a physician and we'd do that. And we started to do uh, methadone, suboxone and indeed some people were seeing some benefit from that uh, and also then once we stabilized them with their opiate use disorder we could move into further care and, and interests that they have including reproductive health, um, just general health stuff that we would all expect from, from our physicians. So that was the birth of the primary care outreach clinic. So presently I'm the community health nurse at the primary care outreach clinic, but we are now based out of the Swan Valley Primary Care Center. So I have a little office there. Um, I have kind of a big umbrella that I'm working on as far as care goes under my community health nursing role. Uh, part of that is kind of a public health portfolio, so sexually transmitted and blood-borne infections, as well as um, access to, I kind of see myself as the hub in a wheel, so access to a lot of other service providers, building some really strong relationships with AFM, with RCMP, with Employment Income Assistance, um, gosh, there's honestly a, a list, uh, Friendship Center, we're building some really good working relationships together and improving people's access to services, because it's kind of all these silos of things. So that's been going really well. Um, one thing that I do is I go out into the community still. I, I book some time off. I go out and I talk to people about their health, connect them to health services, or offer them harm reduction strategies. Uh, we're now doing hepatitis C treatments closer to home, which previously wasn't available. Uh, we're trying to do some more case management and supportive services for folks with HIV so they can get high quality care and not have to always find their way to Winnipeg. There's this huge disconnect between us and, and uh, Winnipeg, even us and Brandon. So there were some things spoke about today. I guess Suboxone, Naloxone is a thing. Um, and uh, I brought with me some of the supplies that we distribute to people um, who need them. Um, one of them is the naloxone program, and that's the antidote for um, opiates. So it's actually a provincial program, and we're just a site that is signed on to participate in this. And uh, this is essentially an, an antidote uh, to an opiate overdose. So. Uh, for some things, carfentanil and these different types of novel opiates, so sort of really powerful ones, this may not actually be an antidote. There's not enough in this kit. But we do have this as part of the programming. People have access to it. They have to come in and see us, or the public health nurses, uh, do a short little return demonstration so that they know how to administer this kit. There used to be a restriction on it whereby only somebody at risk of an opiate overdose qualified for this kit, but now basically anybody who qualifies for this kit. So if yourselves, or you know your loved ones, are even prescribed opiates, uh, or you know people are using opiates, so that's uh, T3s, uh, oxycodones, morphine, hydromorphone, uh, dilaudid, all of these are, are opiates. Suboxone, methadone, all opiates. So if you know anybody who uses opiates, you may want to consider getting a naloxone kit from public health. Also, if you uh, know anybody who uses recreational substances such as cocaine, um, even if they're you know, the ones who, who are able to hide behind <coughs> their, their middle classness in their use, um, they may still benefit from this as well because there are some incidents of um, either cocaine or meth having traces of or full blown amounts of opiates in them. So it might not be a bad idea. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we see it. We do a lot of urine drug screening too as part of our, um, <coughs> our process for people who are engaging us in care um, as part of their care plan. And it's amazing um, the, the myriad of substances that are present. Still primarily uh, prescription based, which uh, there's been some changes to, but meth now is king, unfortunately, uh, 
Um, it's definitely swept across. And we've been playing catch-ups. We've been having meetings about all these, uh, the opiate crisis, and, and now it's just, we're overwhelmed. We haven't even addressed all of those issues because meth has just been such a tidal wave of dysfunction. So, so injection um, is probably the highest risk way that people are using substances, and definitely injection is kind of king around these parts. We do hand out um, sterile injection supplies. Um, now, if you're unfamiliar with um, harm reduction as a kind of a philosophy, and more specifically pro providing people who use substances with injection supplies, it's kind of a mind bender. But you can kind of wrap your head around it um, if you think of, and, and some of this is not a perfect analogy, but we can argue that later. Um, Seat belts are not necessary for the operation of a motor vehicle. The only reason we have seat belts in a car is to reduce harm, right? Like they're not necessary, right? And we as the public pay for that in that product, right? We have to pay for that. You know, the argument would be, I'm not gonna drive poorly, like I don't need a seat belt. Like, you know, I don't wanna pay that extra $1,600 on the cost of my vehicle for a seat belt because I don't need it. Well, we can breed as a society that seat belts save lives and, you know, they may not be necessary, but they're a great idea in the event of an accident, so let's put them in the car. So I mean, that's that's kind of an example of harm reduction, just everyday harm reduction. Bicycle hel helmets, you don't need them. Right? Motorcycle helmets, you don't need them to operate those motor vehicles. But in the event of an accident, they decrease the likelihood of you know, more severe head injuries. So there's those analogies. They're not perfect, but in the same way that, that they reduce harms, Provision of condoms, provision of injection supplies also reduce harms associated with behavior. So it's sort of a non-judgmental way of saying, oh yeah, so you do this thing, but here's some maybe some ways that you can keep yourself safe in the meantime. Um, the other issue is one of a taxpayer issue. I guess it's water. Yeah, uh, and and that is um, to manage people who have already um, become unwell with <coughs> chronic disease is very expensive. Uh, to prevent that disease is pennies on the dollar. So there are some studies out there that show um, uh, significant cost savings when uh, supply distribution, we'll say, had providing supplies to people. Supply distribution is in place. So uh, one of the studies, it's a Canadian study, showed that um, for every uh, <coughs> dollar invested in harm reduction, supply distribution, you save seven dollars uh, to the taxpayer. And so if, I, if this was a room of investors and I said, hey, I've got this investment uh, and, and uh, you, know, you give me a million dollars and uh, by the time you're you know, <coughs> five years old, I'm gonna give you seven million. Well, there's not, I don't think there's a person in this room other than, I don't know how many of you have a million dollars, and I don't, but with that kind of return on investment, right? So it's really return on investment. And so from a taxpayer perspective, it makes perfect sense, thanks. Um, and so there's sort of that economic argument around harm reduction sort of pales in comparison with what the real data says, the real economic data. So it becomes more of a values or I think a moral piece versus an, an actual, hey, why are, why are these people, why are you providing this, you know, this expensive service to people? Uh, it's because it's saving us money. So it's a taxpayer, I can get behind that. So um, you saw the pictures of these? So syringes are only part of it. Uh, hepatitis C, HIV, other bloodborne pathogens can be passed on uh, through really any supply. So sometimes people have to cook their cook their substances. So we hand out. So just and I'm making you aware of this. So if you find them, you kind of know what they are. Um, so these are sterile cooking cups. You know, you see the old movies and people are cooking their stuff in spoons, right? People still use spoons, but there's these cups, one use. Everything everything here is designed for one use. Sterile Sterile water ampules okay, are designed for one use. Filters as well, I won't get into specifics, but filters, these are little cotton, individual cotton filters, one use, one time, one use. Uh, condoms are generally in our bags. We have um, handouts and things. Uh, HIV handouts, Suboxone handouts, depending on what the client wants to accept or not accept. Um, harm reduction guides just around reducing harms, uh, ways to keep yourself safe and healthy. Alcohol swabs as well. So, and we do the teaching on all of these pieces with folks. Um, 
to try to inform them so they can inform their friends and they can hopefully we're going to see less incidents of, of injury, illness, and disease. Yes? Do you supply the containers for that so they don't throw them in the garbage and the kids will get them in some Yeah. Um, we do supply containers, sort of. So um, we have a collection process, and that's what this is here for. We encourage people to bring in their bottles, and we encourage people to have, rather than becoming dependent <coughs> on us or dependent on something to have access, right, is everybody can do it, right? So um, people recycle these. We have labels that we stick on them, and we encourage people to put their sharps into uh, hard plastic containers and then return them to uh, the hospital or currently um, in uh, the province they feel it's acceptable to throw them into uh, household waste so long as they're in a sharps condition. So if anybody wants to bring garbage bags full of uh, used bottles to my office. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we do accept these. Have if you get too many, I'll take them to the recycling. Neil, yes. What's the return rate on those? What's return the return rate, rate on those? Uh, depends on uh, the person's <coughs> where the person resides. You know, uh, the, like in town, Birch yeah. River, you know, Benito, wherever they might reside. Um, it's pretty darn good uh, for folks. What's really encouraging is when I go and do outreach work. Um, I'll talk about some of the resources that are in play further as we kind of get caught up in the real time here. Um, I now work with some uh, public health nursing outreach team, which has actually been. Uh, recent investment this past year, given what's going on. Uh, we go out, we go to houses, and we go to apartment buildings, uh, we go places, and when we go there, um, it's great now. We have this wonderful relationship. Hey, how's it going? Can you come in? Yeah, hey, do you need any blood work done? Yeah, you, what's going on? How's your kids? How's this? How's that? Whatever the scenario is, we have a relationship with these people. And under their sink or somewhere in their back room or whatever, they're pulling these out. Um, and, you know, they're logged. And so it's not this idea that you're going into a, a trap house, you know, where there's this you're going in this shady place, it's like somebody's home, you know, and you go into somebody's home and you sit down and you, you have a good conversation and talk about health, you might exchange some information um, and uh, book them a point, maybe not, and, and they hand you these and you hand them fresh supplies and you, you know, so it's uh, it's not that kind of, again, Hollywood, right? It's, it's a Quentin Tarantino films that I think everybody is, is familiar with. So, uh, so the return rate, uh, I'm impressed. Um, unfortunately, there are still those people who, um, are in situations of um, disrespect uh, or situations uh, whereby they don't have a safe place to use, like some of those people. We, we don't have to imagine the housing crisis we have here. We don't have to imagine how many people are stacked up into, uh, into uh, houses that probably should be condemned. Um, so we have, a housing, we have a housing issue here. So a lot of the uh, improperly disposed of uh, supplies are due to people's inability to have a place to use. Um, to have a place to, I mean, it, most of them, you know, there's so much couch surfing, there's so much uh, sex trade for basically survival sex stuff. So a lot of the stuff that we see out there aren't because uh, they're jerks, uh, it's just their, their situation. Now, the thing that corrects that is actually having shark containers well installed in, in businesses, in um, parks in all these things. We know if you put a garbage can within a certain, this is well studied, put a garbage can within a certain radius will be clear of garbage, right? And then a certain distance from that garbage can, it's littered again, right? It's sort of, we're inherently lazy, right? So in the same way with sharps containers, if there's a reasonable solution dis solution for people to dispose of their sharps, they'll be disposed of, you know? Um, people are not just totally irresponsible human beings. Some are. Um, one of the messages I like to give clients that I work with and, and and kind of picking up on some of the stuff you were talking about is your situation may not be your fault, right? In fact, largely, um, uh, your situation is not your fault, right? We tend to, to really blame, you know, in a personal way for, for people's failures. Um, but I like to say it is your responsibility. So your situation is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And so all of our situations in life, right, we may have a given set of circumstances that have helped make us who we are, but it's our responsibility to know what we do with that. So that's kind of a message I like to talk to people about. Um, pipes, we're trying to get people away from injecting because it's the most harmful. Um, you were talking about meth being made in toilet bowls. Uh, funny enough, there's some studies that have been done out east that show the bacterial load of different substances that people inject, so including uh, pharmaceutical ones. Um, 
Meth has an incredibly high bacterial load, uh, specifically in some, some of the tests of um, <laughs> bugs that you should only find in your gut, right? So, so literally the meth here is really shitty. <laughs> right? um, and people are injecting that, and that's, uh, that's scary. So we, we try to talk about some harm reduction strategies for people, including uh, a campaign that was started uh, out east and it's picked up in Saskatchewan, Crook Your Drugs. Right? Ten seconds, if you if you let it bubble for ten seconds, just ten seconds a little bit, it can decrease that bacterial load. Uh, we're seeing a lot of complications in our through our healthcare system now with infections that just shouldn't be happening. So uh, it's a great concern. Um, so the availability of pipes is one way to, to do that and try to get people to switch from injecting two pipes. And we've actually had a really good uptake of that. A lot of people who were only injecting and multiple, multiple times a day, um, have switched to the pipe and actually appreciate that, their health status has improved. So, so if you see these lying around, there's plastic mouthpieces. But if you see those ever, they are glass, they can break. Right? And that's what that is, right? There's a bubble on the end of it. That's what that is. And it's far, far safer to use a pipe and smoke than it is to inject. There's crack pipes as well for the same reason. You can actually transmit the uh, hepatitis C virus through sharing straws if you're snorting. Uh, you can transmit it through sharing pipes if your lips are all cracked and dry and somebody else has the mouthpiece. Hepatitis C is a really tough virus. So. Just to give you an idea, these are just basically a straight glass rod. So if you find these in the community, um, there is a way to handle them and not to handle them. Um, number one, um, public health nurses are in the schools uh, with teachers and they're showing them sort of these things. If you find these, don't touch. So there were some studies out in Montreal a few years ago um, and uh, I can't remember if they studied over what period of time, but all the needle stick injuries in children were because they intentionally handled the, the needle, let's say, right? So none of them were just, just ow, you know, kicked a needle laying in the grass. It, it was all of them, that they, it was all from intentional handling. So the thing is you've got to teach kids not to handle this stuff. Know what it is, don't handle it. If you find it, just tell an adult. So if you do find them on your property or around town, um, you can pick them up with a set of tongs or just a glove. Um, so long as the needle is held not above your elbow. So if you hold something above your elbow, it can fall. So if you find if you find a syringe, you can pick it up. You can pick it up. Always keep it lower. It's kind of the lowest lowest point. Again, not above where it can fall. On. You can pick it up and you can place it into a, a plastic, solid plastic container, and it's done. So it's really kind of scary, or we think of it as dirty, but it's actually the Disease transmission that occurs from any needle stick injury uh, is incredibly low, like incredibly low. Um, and again, these, all these things are well studied. So there's the potential risk, and there's things that, that increase the risk and lower the risk, right? Exposure to sun, temperature, how old it is, where it's where it is. There's all these like little nuances to it. But for the most part, it's scary. And I think what it represents in our minds is scary because it, it activates our, our values system, right? Which, which is an emotional system largely. Um, and it, so it kind of pisses us off too. Uh, but as far as what they represent is they're a nuisance and you know, we need to get people to dispose them properly. But if you do find them, you can pick them up. Gloved, rubber gloves, great idea, right? Um, pair of tongs, great idea. And put them into uh, a hard plastic container. And that's how you would dispose of that stuff. Anything to add on that? No? Uh, and the same things with the glass pipes, right? The glass pipes haven't generally come in contact with blood, whereas syringes have generally come in contact, right? Um, but they would just be cleaned up and put into a plastic container so they don't poke through a garbage bag or anything like that. Um, am I speaking way too quickly? A little bit? Yeah. My mouth is just becoming less dry now. Um, all right. So we have the take-home naloxone program, supply distribution. And if anybody has questions about this, or it literally is like making me so angry that this is a thing, come and talk to me. I, I genuinely, I won't 
I won't judge. I will literally, I would love to talk to you about that and hear your perspective on it because it can be incredibly infuriating. Um, and it depends on who your mother-in-law is as well. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if you're getting this certain messaging, I'm sure you are. She's a lovely lady. Uh, depending on what her values are and, and where I'm coming from, right? And so I just tell people, this stuff is to stop the spread of disease transmission, to connect with people who otherwise I wouldn't have the opportunity to connect with, um, and offer them health and services. And, and so it's win, 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 win. And investment-wise, it's win as well. So there's also a, what's been created since all this mayhem, there's also a harm reduction peer advisory group. So that's people who use substances, get together um, in an organized fashion, um, have meetings, and then inform us, providers, and other people who are in that, uh, about uh, gaps or concerns or things that they want to do to promote health amongst people who use substances. It's been a great organization. Uh, called the Health Network, and they're out there cleaning up syringes to its spring. They'll, you'll see in the newspaper probably, they'll be out, the Health Network will be out and looking for syringes, do a whole suite with the community, looking to clean it up and be part of the solution. Um, there's also the opiate agonist treatment program, which I mentioned, so Suboxone and Methadone, which we're running. And there's now outreach uh, programming through public health, so there's been an investment in that as well. So I felt like when I left that, and came into the more of the primary care role, that was a bit of a gap, and that's been addressed now. So again, there's public health versus now getting out there specifically to talk to people about substance use, safer substance use, um, and <coughs> options for treatment uh, if they're interested. And in the near future, I'm working with some community partners and some other folks um, to do a smart recovery group. Smart recovery is, um, uh, I guess, a, a recovery program that's not a 12-step program. And uh, it's going to be coming to us, our community, shortly. So hopefully there will be posters up around town and these sorts of things. Uh, weekly meetings is what we're aiming for uh, to give people an option to uh, get together and, um, and work on their own recovery journey. Because um, even somebody who's actively using is usually in a stage of some recovery. And that might seem weird, but they're just, they're not doing it and not thinking about it, they're thinking about it, they're just not at that place where they're thinking about it and not doing it at the same time. So anyways, that's, that's a whole continuum. Okay. And speaking about the conditions that foster some of this stuff, um, in my own mind, I'm always trying to make meaning of this madness. Like it just seems, it seems mad, but I will share a little snippet. But if, if I tell you this, you can't leave this room. So, um, uh, I'm a substance user. I drink caffeine. Right? I don't drink alcohol. That doesn't agree with me. I do crazy things and, and I tend to drink and stay drunk. So I don't use alcohol. I can't use alcohol. Um, I used to use stimulants. Uh, I became homeless because of my stimulant use. Uh, this was back in the day, way back in the day, back in the dirty BC days. Uh, it was part of my youth, part of my forming, storming, and norming. Um, I never got caught for using substances, so I never got a criminal record. If I had had a criminal record, um, I would never be able to speak to you like this. I would never be able to do the work I'm doing because I would be ostracized, right? There would be a barrier for me be <coughs> to become a professional, right? Even though a lot of the data supports that people have a substance use trajectory and they age out of it. Like they hit a certain age and it's kind of like it sort of the substance use falls away. Um, not always. So one of the issues that I think is large in what we're seeing now is that, that there's a criminalization of substance use, right? Um, that in of itself is not a crime against any people, right? Stealing is, right? Um, you know, robbery, all these things. Right? But me using substances, and for the reasons I was using them, uh, good and bad reasons, um, you know, it wasn't a crime against anyone. Yet, you know, I could be punished and, you know, thereby I could participate in certain segments of society. Law enforcement would be one of them. Uh, you know, nursing would be another, perhaps, you know, a lawyer, these sorts of things. So if you want to do some interesting reading online, check out what Portugal has done. So decriminalization is different than legalization. We've legalized weed. Alcohol is legal, right? But there's there's another step in between that, and it's decriminalization. By the way, I should announce at this point that I am a nurse. I'm obliged to speak through a nursing lens. It is not necessarily an agreement with my employer. 
<laughs> okay? <laughs> so the things that I'm saying are according to Neil, the nurse, right? They're not necessarily according or in alignment with my employer, who is Prairie Mountain Health, right? Although Prairie Mountain Health is doing amazing work, they're facilitating amazing work. They're literally going through huge transformations to deliver the right kind of care to the people where they need them at the right time. I'm proud to work for PMH at this point in time. So now that that caveat's over. <laughs> so, so decriminalization is a whole other thing. So look up the Portugal experiment and make up your own minds. Uh, so just do some, do some sleuthing online and, and look at what Portugal has done, see what some of the outcomes are, see what the critics are saying, um, you know, see what proponents are saying. Interesting, I won't give any more away to that story. Um, where was I going with that? Um, conditions, another one would be, um, and, and you, you spoke to it, but our relationship with, uh, with indigenous uh, people, right? It's an atrocious one. I would encourage everybody in this room, if you have the courage to challenge your own assumptions and beliefs and biases, to, um, to read the book or listen to it. It's an audio book as well. Uh, 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. It's, it's a brief, it's not gonna be a 14 hour listen on Audible, um, but it's a it's fantastic glimpse into um, the past and present system by which forms the relationship that we have with the indigenous persons. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's quite an amazing um, read. So that's 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. And then the last piece is, uh, there's an interesting TED talk by Johan Hari, Johan Hari, it's called Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. So everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. It's worth uh, a watch. Now, Jonathan has some tunnel vision in, in the way he presents it. Sort of the, the one thing, you know, it's, you know, it's almost a silver bullet-like approach. So take, take it with a grain of salt, but essentially, uh, what he's saying has incredible validity around the environment that people grow up in um, uh, has either a protective effect, right? I mean, it's all, it has all things. Let's not say it's either or, it's not binary. It has a protective, right, or destructive effect, right? Um, can foster uh, uh, healthy, you know, the growth of a healthy individual or, or basically guarantee an individual to uh, a high degree of dysfunction. So check it out, I, I, won't, uh, I won't give any of that away. Uh, and again, this is all trying to make meaning because as we all sit here and we hear these things, a lot of it's just like, man, like our culture and our communities have gone to hell in a handbasket, you know? Um, and I think some of that's true. Uh, and so how do we make meaning from that? You know, where, where do we need to invest our time and energy and attention uh, in order to affect change? Is it always gonna be downstream? Um, and, and dealing with mayhem, you know, uh, through RCMP and paramedics and the emergency department, or are we gonna move upstream and, and start to decrease that dysfunction up here so that it decreases what's happening down here? So I'm always searching to make meaning, and I also do that from a, a place of trying to survive this job, because every day I work with people and I hear about their trauma, I, I do get to know them, and I do hear their lived experience. I do work with the young women who are being victimized in our community by the men, um, you know, for substances, uh, for sex, for a place to sleep. Right? This is all normal in our community. This is going on in real time right now. So I have to make meaning, because if I don't, um, I'm gonna cry. If I don't, I will become an incredible, bitter person, or I will pick up the bottle again. Uh, just to numb them. So there's some vicarious trauma. Uh, I think that you know different uh, care providers can have, and definitely in this job, wow, it's a it's a quite something to see the spectacle. Uh, so just consider this: everybody who's using substances has a story. Um, some's not a great story. Um, Others is a great story. I'm like, so why are you homeless? Like, you had, you had everything, right? So there's, there's a mixed bag of, of stuff, why people are where they're at in life. Um, but everybody's got a story, and it's not this myth that people don't care, they just want to party, they just want to get high. Um, that, that's a subset of people who use substances, you know. Um, it's, not, it's not the majority. Most people who use substances are suffering in some way, and in some in really profound ways. So uh, collectively, um, we need to make sure people are accountable for their behaviors, absolutely. Um, but we also need to, with the other hand, 
um, you know, offer them some compassion. So all the pieces kind of fit together. So any questions about uh, anything I've rambled on about? Yes, I'm at the primary health care clinic. Yep. People can access me by appointment, drop in, those sorts of things. So Neil, I have a question. Yes. Uh, one of the things you and I talked about a little while ago was the opportunity to have you come and present to our team at co-op. And can you just elaborate a little bit on what your abilities are to do so with, within the community? Sure, yeah. I mean, I can go out and meet with anybody or, or family or organization or community to talk about um, whatever it is they want to talk about related to substance use. Uh, specifically, what we had spoken of was um, sharps, sharps disposal in an occupational health and safety perspective. So if you have employees or you yourselves are running a business and you, know, you have to meet certain standards for um, safety in the workplace, uh, we can talk about uh, some of that stuff with regards to safety and disposal or handling of sharps um, or messaging that should go along with that or access to bathrooms versus no access to bathrooms. So kind of along that uh, continuum. Uh, related to kind of occupational health and safety framework or exposure of blood and body fluids. There have been some organizations where um, there's, uh, they ended up having to clean up uh, a mess that was created with blood and body fluids, um, and that's also something that I'd be happy to, to talk about. So what I'd like to do is just, I'm going to put Darren on the spot here. Corey, can you jump up here? Last night we were having supper, and Corey asked me a question that I couldn't actually answer, even though I love to talk. Darren, I'm going to actually get him to throw this at you and it was his respect to the medical response. Oh yeah, I'd asked if um, the, I guess the local fire department is like a first responder model. Do, do, do you guys respond to medical or no, traumatic not incidents? At all. Not at all. No. Okay. Okay. And I think it's good for us to be aware of, to know who's going to be responding to these types of calls within the community. Um, there is another another thought that I wanted to bring bring to bear here as well. And one of the things that I'd heard Corey present before was when you were a 911 supervisor, uh, one of the things you spoke of is how do you respond as an individual to a situation when it's occurring? And maybe maybe there's something you guys can share with respect to this, but if you'd like to speak on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So I mean, from our perspective, I mean, when I, uh, people often ask me, you know, what should I do um, if I'm with somebody that's on methamphetamine or if I'm thinking they're becoming aggressive or violent, um, the, the standardized messaging and how we respond to these folks, specifically to meth-induced uh, uh, psych psychotic patients um, or any me mental health issue that can create a patient that is aggressive or violent, is the biggest rule is don't touch these folks. <laughs> Right, yeah, and I mean, I, I'm not gonna speak like to your, to your own policies and procedures, but for the layman public, a methamphetamine user does not like to be touched, that's been proven. Um, I always say as a paramedic or a nurse or a physician, uh, human contact is a good thing. Whenever I would present myself to a patient when I was an active paramedic, I would always put my hand on somebody's shoulder 100% of the time, and I would say, you know, my name's Corey, I'm here to help you. And that human contact feels good, it's well intended. Methamphetamine users do not like being touched and they don't like being crowded, right? They're already hyper, hyper paranoid. So if I am the methamphetamine user and you're concerned about your safety, human, human beings bolster their numbers, right? To show strength and power. And a lot of people think if you crowd and show that use of force to these folks, that's gonna make a difference. It's actually the worst thing you can do. Right? You always have to have a way out. If we're responding to a patient in that corner, I'm, I'm, I'm acutely aware of my points of exit <coughs> as well. Um, don't touch them um, uh, and give them water. Offer them water. A, a patient experiencing a mental health crisis and methamphetamine users are typically extraordinarily thirsty. And just offering somebody water, calling them by their name and not touching them, not crowding them, lowers the anxiety that they're having. That's been proven, right? And I, I don't know if I need to get into body language and stuff like that. I, I don't think I need to do that, but that's the advice I would have. Nailed it. Yeah. yeah. So there is one other thing I, I'd like to just add. Uh, you guys have done a great job in talking about how uh, to take care of the needles after they're used. And I know during, the, during one of our meetings, it's gotta be six months ago, there was a program. Who was running that program? We were actually talking about bringing needles in air containers in. Were you? Was that you? No. Nope. <coughs> I can't remember. 
or maybe that was Brianna. Yeah. Was it Brianna? Yeah. Uh, one of the RCM team members. We were talking about how to how to <coughs> collect containers uh, for that very purpose. So I, I think that program is still alive and well, if I recall. Uh, the, the, the the container program. Yeah, I think it's I think it needs another you shot know in the arm. shot in the arm, hence so why they try to give it a shot in the arm. But yeah, bring your bring these in, we can use them. There is one thing that I wanted to add to, and I, I challenged uh, our MLA, uh, Rick Wolchuk, on this. 20 years ago when I was at uh, Decor Cabinets down in Morden, we were going through a meth uh, crisis uh, because it was easy to make. It was coming over the North Dakota border in, in tankers, basically, and it was almost impossible to get rid of. Um, but one of the things we challenged the provincial government at the time on, and I've asked Rick now to re-explore it, is a formal provincial uh, incineration program rather than this going to the landfill. Because uh, it doesn't mean always that a cap will stay on. It doesn't mean always that uh, we're going to have a safe disposal. But uh, a provincial incineration program would probably uh, help us in that regard. So I've asked them to take a look at that and see if there's any any action that could be could be made for it. So anybody have any comments or questions? I just want to know uh, as far as we're looking at staff safety and people are in front lines and moving people to danger every night. Count yourself safe. Is there a program that gives people the basics of what to do and how to recognize it? And we're getting some of it here, but something that we can give to our staff or something that we can access some kind of information that this is what we need to know. I'm not sure I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any formalized programs uh, like that. Um, the difficulty with that is oftentimes you've got um, you know mixed things going on. So anytime you formalize something, it's it's pretty narrow. You know, like the knife attack comes like this, right? It's just it's not realistic. Um, it's such a dynamic situation. So I think just uh, if you can tap into some resources like we've done today um, and and spread that. But are you familiar with any formalized? Yeah, so um, it, so Winnipeg, we're working with um, uh, a, con a big uh, consulting firm right now to acknowledge and deal with the increased violence that <coughs> the paramedics are facing. Um, and there's something that's called spear training. Um, it, it's not you're going to spear somebody with a, <laughs> with a spear. It stands for something. And that's essentially techniques on how to disengage, how to keep yourself safe, and, and how to recognize body language signs. Right? So that would be something that you should be looking at. I would lean on police, not not to, to put the spotlight on them, but they would really be considered the body language experts, right? They're the professionals that know what to look for for people's body language and basic stuff like when somebody blades you. Blading means when I present to you, I'm open to you, I'm facing you, that's comfortable. If I blade you, that means I'm turning this way. If I present it to you guys for the whole hour and I'm like this, it's uncomfortable, right? I'm hiding something, I, I'm not comfortable, and typically that stance means you're gonna attack or you're gonna run. So if you can lean on police, so in Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg police give a really good um, you know, community uh, talk on body language signs, how to disengage, um, spear training. I know there's some mental health groups as well that speak to what mental health conditions look like. And like I said before, don't be so quick to think everybody's gonna be violent. And I've engaged uh, MLCC and Canada Post as well with some of their internal policies as far as what to do if we find drugs or if we encounter something that's violent. So it's a, it, it's a fine line for us to walk to engage on your policies and procedures. Um, but I would lean on those resources. There's also some service providers like CMHA does a great job, I think, um, in working with a lot of folks uh, just come in off the street, you know, just come in for chat or coffee. So they might also be a good resource just to talk to, hey, what do you guys do? Because they, they do have some, some expertise, I think, just experientially in that sort of stuff. To be respectful of time, uh, I just want to close up. And I think what we can do is if there's a few minutes afterwards, if people uh, would like to speak with either Neil or, or Corey, please feel free to. Um, I want to thank the Westwood for hosting. I want to thank all of you for coming. I think we've got an absolutely uh, fantastic uh, community. We've got a lot of resources that maybe some others don't. And uh, the fact that we've got an engaged business community and healthcare professional community, police community, uh, you know, 
the chamber, everybody's involved, and the fact that the town is supportive uh, of this as well, uh, I'm thrilled. And I, I, I see a lot of progress and gains that can be made here, so I want to thank all of you for coming. But what I'd really like to do is thank both of these fine gentlemen for sharing with us today. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you,